Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, I, looking across the crowds, a lot of folks were missing today. I know school's back and families are back, but I think COVID is giving us another uh, left hook here today, possibly folks that are, uh, have stayed home. And if you're gathered with us virtually, thank you for uh, joining our service today. S something I wanted to say just uh, at the outset uh, as we went to two services when COVID uh, hit, and uh, guys, what we've realized is that this service, uh, when everybody shows up, um, uh, hopefully post-COVID, I hope we can say that at some point in time, um, but it is, it is very full in this room and uh, will be filled up very quickly and so um, one of the things that we realize is that unless we stay in two services, it's going to be very difficult for us to continue to grow. One of our, one of our um, problems, if you will, it's, it's, it's a good problem to have, but all of our classrooms at 9 o'clock are, are full. And so most of you were in Life, book, life Group this past uh, service, and so those, those Life Group rooms are full to capacity but as I just walked through the hallway, there are a lot of classrooms open at this hour, uh, which is good. And that means we can start new classes. We can have uh, groups meeting at, at 1045. Uh, one of the things I want to share with you from my heart as your pastor, and specifically of parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, I want to encourage you to make sure that your students, middle school and high school, come to one or the other of our worship services here gathered. Whether that's with you or not, um, please, please, please um, bring your students in here. And I know some students, middle school or high school, they may say, I don't want to go in there. Um, I was that way probably with uh, Doug and Brenda Stanley saying, I don't want to go. Um, but I don't remember Doug or Brenda asking my opinion about going to church. I just don't remember that. Um, I asked Caleb, I said, Caleb, did I ever ask you if you wanted to go to church? And he just kind of shook his head in the early service. And so I don't know when we started asking our kids if they want to go to church or not, but uh, I think that's ridiculous, to be honest with you. And so that is not up for discussion in our home. I don't think it should be in yours. And this is your pastor talking. Uh, I know you may not want me parenting, but uh, I'm just going to say, um, this is not the way we parent. I don't... If they said they didn't want to go to English tomorrow or uh, math class, I don't think any of you would say, okay, honey, you know, let's not, we don't have to go to math, you know, it's such a bad subject. But, um, you know, I would say this, parents, be very aware if your child doesn't want to be in here, uh, the glory of God, the presence of God, we believe is, is here. It's a very uncomfortable place for someone who is maybe uh, rebelling, uh, or really uh, kind of their life is headed in a different direction. Whenever we see someone moving away from worship and not attending very often, sometimes we could say, you know, it may be that their, their life is, they don't, they don't want to be in the middle pres of the presence of God because that's painful. Amen? And you either do one of two things when you're in the presence of God. You either repent or you run. Uh, you either marvel or you run away. And so um, as parents, though, we, we need to make sure that they're here. And so please do that, parents, either one or the other. Micah is teaching an all-youth life group at 1045. So if you're a student in here, your parents are in the other service. Uh, I honestly, my personal conviction is I love it when families sit together. Um, I've never been able to sit with my family in church, <laughs> so for obvious reasons. Um, but I, you know, if I could, I would have sat with Caleb and Caitlin and I'd have had my arm around Caleb today, right? Uh, cause I, I want to sit with my kids and I want to be there. And one of the things about a middle school boy or, or girl looking up at their dad singing at the top of his lungs and worshiping the Lord in a worship service, that does something to you. They're modeling a Christian life. And when a young child looks up at mom and dad and they're singing and they're worshiping and they're serving and they're giving and they're loving the Lord, that, that is a powerful thing. And ultimately, that's why, you know, that's why they stay in church, right? It's because you modeled it for them. They, they, didn't, they didn't think that there's any other way to live 
but to walk with the Lord, to serve the Lord, and to be a part of the local church that Jesus died for. So that's just from your pastor. Please, please, please uh, follow that prescription, if you will, uh, and that mandate. Let's jump into the Word of God today. As we open up, we're talking about the coming here, kind of another interlude. We're interlude between the, seventh, uh, the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. Uh, we're in the seventh seal. <coughs> Somebody bring me a bottle of water, that'd be awesome. I'm going to have another uh, coughing attack here. I, I don't have COVID, I promise. But, um, but here we've got this, I did not know this, y'all. And, and I, I should have known this. Guys, this book, this scroll that Jesus is able to open, guys, that is ultimately, you can lay this scroll open across the whole seven-year tribulation period of time, okay? And ultimately into the second coming of Christ, the destruction of this earth, and the creation of a new heaven and new earth. This scroll is the title deed to the universe, this opening up of the end-time revelation events of all of world history uh, is the most amazing document that we have. We have been given this revelation to understand. And where we have gotten to uh, in seals 1 through 7, we've opened the seventh seal. And inside of the seventh seal, we have been opening up uh, and reading in the seventh seal, understanding that there are seven trumpets that are going to be blown. These powerful angels are going to uh, blow seven trumpets. Up to this point, we have blown six trumpets. After each trumpet is blown, we are seeing devastating judgment on the earth. Each trumpet is blown, and there ensues judgment upon the land, judgment upon the sea, judgment upon the fresh water. Demons are coming up out of the abyss of hell to possess people's lives. And then a demon army comes to ultimately um, kill. Um, uh, and up to this point, over half of the world is going to be annihilated in God's judgment. So here we are now at the seventh, almost to the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet you could say is a trumpet of victory the kingdom of man is going to become the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ it is going to be passed on and ultimately taken by our Lord Jesus Christ for his own and the kingdom of God is going to come upon the earth so this seventh trumpet is coming. What we're going to look at today is an interlude, but I do believe that everything we're going to look at today is anticipating, just like the interlude between the sixth and seventh seal, this interlude is everything that is just about, it's tipping into the category of the finishing of God's judgment on the earth. So a strong angel, and, and then ultimately today what we're looking at is the, the sweetness of victory and the bitterness of judgment. That could be a better title, the sweetness of victory and the bitterness of judgment that John is going to taste uh, in this uh, passage of Scripture. Let's jump in, Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10. Can y'all believe we're going to go all the way through, Re we're going to finish Revelation 10. I'm, I'm doing all right. Amen? We are rolling, y'all. This is not Romans. This is Revelation. We are rolling. So if you'll pick up with me, we're just going to go through this couple of verses at a time. And we'll title this first section, Another Strong Angel. Y'all say, Another Strong Angel. It's a very important title. Verse 1. Why do you say that? I saw, John says, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven clothed with a cloud and the rainbow was upon his head and his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book which was open had in his hand a little book which was open 
All right, so he says, I saw. Y'all see those first two words, I saw. Each time John is moving into a new vision. So understand Revelation is a series of visions. Uh, there is a beginning of the vision and there is a closure of the vision. A new vision when he starts into seeing something new in heaven that ultimately is going to be affecting the earth. He says, I saw over and over and over he does this. It marks the beginning of a new vision. He says, I saw another. This is an important word. This strong angel, there are a lot of people that believe this is Jesus, okay? The believe that this is the Lord Jesus Christ is this strong angel that comes to the earth, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land that we're going to read about in just a moment. Uh, guys, I'm going to be, I lean toward it not being. And I'm going to tell you a few reasons why. Uh, the word another, that word actually means another of the same kind. And it is referring to, the word another is referring to the same angels that are blowing their trumpets. And so it is referring to another strong angel here, referring to these uh, angels that are blowing their trumpets. Um, one of the reasons I don't believe it's Christ is you'd have another coming of Christ uh, that we don't believe uh, that there is a third coming of Christ. Um, I know there's some arguments against that, but that definitely, if Jesus' feet are hitting the land and hitting the sea, it would be another coming of Christ. Uh, the other thing is there is an oath that is made swearing by God in heaven uh, that the end is coming soon, and I don't know that Jesus would ever swear to himself about himself. Uh, he is swearing to God that the end is coming, that there will be no longer any delay in the uh, final judgments on the earth. So that's another reason. Um, and then also John gives other names identifying Jesus whenever he is seen in one of the visions. And those names are not attributed to this angel. You may not want all that information, but there it is. Revelation 5, 2 says, And I saw here back in chapter 5, verse 2, And I saw a strong angel, another uh, another reference to a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. Now is this the same angel? Is that angel? It could possibly be. But there's also an association that will be important later to understand that a strong angel is proclaiming about a book that's going to be opened. Here we see in this passage of scripture a strong angel that is coming and is bringing about the, uh, the little book, as it says, the open book, as it says here in our passage. Clothed with a cloud, the Bible says here. Clothed with a cloud. Symbolic of great power, bringing judgment. It says a rainbow was upon his head. Rainbow representing God's covenant of mercy in the midst of great judgment. Um, face like the sun. <coughs> face like the sun. Brilliant, radiant, light bearer. Uh, again, this is kind of uh, where these descriptions are closely related to Jesus. Um, feet like pillars of fire, another reference that makes us think. So whereas I believe this is another angel, um, I can't be so dogmatic that it's not Jesus here. I just, I just personally don't think that it is. There's some reasons why. So face like a pillars of fire, this angel has legs and feet like firm, stable pillars, immovable, immovable from God's mission and direction. How many of you say that's what I want to be? I want to be immovable from God's mission and direction. This angel is determined to fulfill what, what God has asked him, this angel, to fulfill. Fire may represent unbending holiness. Uh, this angel is a holy creature, a holy creation of God that is meant for the purpose, very purpose of, uh, especially here, bringing about a declaration, a vow that the end is coming. In his hand, the Bible says, is a little book, an open book. Seven, I believe this may be the seven-sealed sc scroll lying fully open. Now, at this point, we have... We have unfolded each seal. We have unfolded this book, this document. 
And so as it's described here, a little book, it, is, uh, it can also be understood as an open book that is laying here. The reason that it is, it is smaller maybe than what we would think of when the scroll is opened in heaven, I don't know about you guys, when John is describing Jesus who is able to open the scroll and John begins to weep and then Jesus is able to, I think of a big scroll, right? I think of this massive throne of God uh, in, the, in the hand of, of God is the, is the, uh, is the uh, scroll and then Jesus comes and takes the scroll and he's able to open the seals. I'm thinking a big book. Here we see a little book and I'm not sure why the vision is described here and then uh, for the purpose of, and guys, this is one of those dreams. All of these things are very peculiar. These are very odd things that John is describing here. He's going to be commanded to eat this book in just a minute. Okay, we're going to read that. That's kind of like one of those dreams I wake up from, right? It's like, was, I was riding a zebra. I was riding a zebra. I don't know why. Why was I riding a zebra? You know, it's kind of like I had this dream, and I'm like, what, what am I doing? You know, what is going on here? It's kind of peculiar. This vision, John is describing to us these things, and as peculiar as they are, he's being faithful. That's why we know he's being faithful, because he's putting it in whether we are understanding it or not. And it may very well be that John, even pinning these things, did not fully understand all of the symbolisms that he is describing. Some of those things we may better understand now because of moving into the end times that we are understanding them because they're more visible or God has intended the revelation to be given to us now of what they mean. In his hand a little book. Uh, we see that in Revelation 5 again. Um, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. <clears throat> so this reveals basically all the terrors of divine judgment that are yet to come. All right, let's move on. So the secret cry of the strong angel, or better yet, this is a better title, the secret cry of the peals of thunder that are going to be sounding for John to hear, for him to understand, but for him yet to be forbidden to write down. Let's look at this passage. So he placed, he placed, this strong angel placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land, the last part of verse 2. Then verse 3, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Let's process that just for a minute. In his right his right foot is on the sea. His left foot is on the land. Uh, ultimately showing that this angel is given absolute authority over creation, over the land, over the sea. Preparation here for the seventh trumpet and the seven bowls. Seven peals of thunder utter their voices. Possibly God the Father speaking. Um, we have to think that God the Father is speaking potentially here to seal up the things that are spoken, but possibly in the thunder, we're not sure. But what was spoken, it was spoken so that John could understand what was being said, and John was about to write down what was said. But then a voice comes from heaven, or from this vision, in this vision, to John saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken. I mean, can y'all believe this? Thunder is speaking to John. He, the thunder and the thunder rolls makes me think of an old country song. But anyway, the thunder is speaking and the apostle is forbidden to write but to seal up the things which the, the thunder has spoken. 
Now understand this, uh, the prophet Daniel was forbidden in several places in uh, certain elements of his visions that he was forbidden to say. Look over in 2 Corinthians, it's on the screen here, 2 Corinthians 12, 3 through 4. Paul says, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. This sounds like Lord of the Rings to me a little bit, doesn't it? Words that men are, unintelligible words that uh, man is not permitted to speak. So Paul hears these, I don't know if Paul knew this, he could have written a book and made a bunch of money, like all these other people that have been to heaven. But he wasn't permitted to speak them. Deuteronomy 29, 29, guys, this is, if, if there's nothing, if you don't hear anything else today, please take this scripture away with you and hide it in your heart. Look what it says. The secret things belong to the Lord. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of his law. The secret things belong to the Lord. I don't know, guys, but just kind of a lesson learned is anybody ever tells you they got a secret or they have secret knowledge? Red flag. Red flag. Anybody ever tells you, they say, listen, I have the secret to solve all of your problems, that should be a double red flag. Anybody that says they have secret knowledge or secret revelation or, you know what, nobody else understands this but me. Hello. No, friend. You, you have just, I, you just lost me right there. The, the, um, the secret things. Guys, there are things that, God has sealed up that God has even spoken to his prophets and here to the apostle John that he says seal it up do not declare what I've just told you now all these things are pondered in the heart of John he knew what was said in that thunder didn't he but he sealed it up but here's the part I love about this you see some people, all they're concerned about is wanting some kind of secret knowledge. Wanting something secret so that they can have the secret so that we will pay for the secret. But the reality is, y'all, and here we see in Deuteronomy, look what he says. But the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever. The things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. I don't know if you guys feel this way about the Bible, but this belongs to us. The revelation. And listen, some of you, some of you have proved this week that this is not a treasure in your life because you hadn't picked it up, looked at it, thought about it all week long. For some reason, you do not treasure the Bible. But to others of us in this room, this is our greatest treasure that there's ever been. I've, hit, I've had men walk me around their house to show me all of their treasured possessions. Anybody ever done this? And for guys, it's usually guns, right? Let me come back here, man. Let me show. Pete, Pete's done this. I've gone to his house. Hey, man, let me show you my, let me show you my shotguns and my rifles and all oh, my bullets and everything. You know, I'm waiting for a zombie apocalypse here. Let me tell you. You know, and you're wondering what in the world? Why do you need an Uzi? You know, <laughs> what's going on here? But we we love to show everybody our our all of our most prized possessions and. You'll see people that collect Coke bottles and you'll see people who collect coins and people who collect different things. They want to show you all the collections. Guys, there should be, for Christians, for believers, there should be 
no greater possession in our life than the Word of God. And that we, we want to show people this treasured possession that we've hidden in our hearts. Amen, church? And that is ours. It's ours. And our children forever. Not one word will pass away, but will endure forever and ever and ever and ever. Number three, an oath is declared to delay no longer. Let's look at this oath that's made. Verse 5. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Now who is that? It's specifically the Lord Jesus Christ here. So that's where I have a problem with this strong angel swearing by himself. I know that could happen. Uh, but he's here standing on the sea and on the land and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Secondly, who created heaven and the things in it. Speaking of heaven. So he created heaven and the things that are in heaven, and earth, and the earth, the third thing is the earth, and the things in it. The fourth thing is, and the sea, and the things in it. And what does he swear? He swore by the Lord that there will be delay no longer. There will be delay no longer. Basically, this angel is saying, I'm promising y'all, it's, it's coming to an end. We are, we are right at the very pivotal place of the great tribulation, of the great day of the Lord, of the last and the seventh trumpet to sound, and the seven bowls that are going to be poured out, and ultimately, the coming of the kingdom of God. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, do you see that? He's speaking, there will be delay no longer, and he's speaking directly to the seventh angel and the seventh trumpet when he is about to sound, the seventh trumpet, then the mystery of God is finished. The mystery of God is finished. And he preached to his servants, the prophets. Wow, there's a lot there. So he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things in it, the earth and the things in it, the sea and the things in it. I just want to ask y'all real quick. Do y'all believe that this strong angel, and I have to do this, this strong angel believes in a supernatural creation? Do you believe that? He is swearing by the one who created the heavens and everything in the heavens and in heaven and everything in heaven. Every, he, who created the earth and everything in the earth and he created the sea and everything in the sea. Guys, I believe with all my heart that Moses believed in a supernatural creation. I believe Jesus believed in a supernatural creation because he's the only one that was there. And I believe that this strong angel believes in a supernatural creation. Everything in it. God created the earth and everything in it. Everything in it God created. I've never seen a Maybe I have. I think maybe at the zoo. Do they have a giraffe at the Atlanta Zoo? Do y'all remember? Do they have a giraffe? So I guess I have seen a giraffe. All those animals really smell bad, but it, I think I've seen a giraffe. But that's got to be one of the most peculiar animals on the face of the earth, isn't it? There ain't nothing like a giraffe. How do you make a neck? That, you know, that's crazy. The thing's eaten at the top of the tree. You don't worry about what all's getting eaten down here. Just... Do you know that the only thing 
The only information that a giraffe has inside of a giraffe, the only scientific information that a giraffe has on the inside of a giraffe is to produce another giraffe. There is no information in a giraffe to produce or reproduce with anything other than a giraffe and produce and produce anything other than a giraffe. A giraffe can only reproduce with a giraffe and a, and a giraffe can only produce a giraffe. That's it. And you're telling me that somehow some mammal came upon, crawled up out of the goo, from goo to you by way of a zoo, came up out of the goo and produced us a giraffe. There's no other information inside of you that can produce anything other than a human being. No information. We're all talking about the science. All the politicians are talking about the science. Follow the science. Follow the science. And then we watch National Geographic. Hey, follow the science. Come on, people. No DNA. No information inside of you that can produce anything other than a human being. Guess what? You ain't going to produce no chicken. It's impossible. The scripture tells us that God created each kind of species and that he gave them the ability to reproduce after their own kind. Thus the giraffe stays a giraffe. On the boat, got off the boat, and reproduced now so that they're as tall as a boat. They are. This, I just love it. I love when I find passages of Scripture where the declaration, clear declaration about creation is here so that every false teacher false prophet, false Protestant pastor that doesn't believe in a supernatural creation is absolutely perfectly refuted by the Bible. Why would anybody come to know Christ when our church people don't believe in a supernatural creation? Jesus said it, if they don't believe Moses, they won't believe in me either. How are we ever going to communicate Christ to people when they don't believe in creation? And you don't believe in creation, more or less. Let me just say this, Christians, look at me. You don't believe in a supernatural creation. You have a spiritual problem. And your biggest spiritual problem is you are believing something that is totally contrary to the Bible. Thus, you have invented your own religion. Follow the science. I could say something about that too. I know I've been very pessimistic lately about government. <laughs> Y'all, I don't believe any of them. I don't believe any of them. You may follow this person, that person. You say, I believe this person, I believe that person. Here's, here's what's happening, y'all. Don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated with all this. We are being set up for this. We are being set up. If this, I'm telling y'all, if this doesn't happen, if this seven-year Tribulation, if these seven trumpets are not blown in the next 10 years, I am going to be blown away. Totally surprised. All right, I'm almost 50. When I'm almost 60, I'll come up here and go, y'all, I thought it was going to happen. I'm telling you, I thought it was going to happen. When I'm 70, I'll say, y'all got to be out of your mind. I can't believe it hasn't been. I'm 80, I'll say, man, you got to be crazy. We're being set up. Look at everything lining up, y'all. And you know what the world's doing? They're marching. They're following people that say peace 
and safety. They're just marching. <laughs> just tell me what to do. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Tell me what to do. And we're just marching and following these people who don't seem to know what they're doing. Absolutely don't know what they're doing. This is too much. This is too much. You can pretend like you know what you're doing, but COVID-19, it's too much. Especially with a whole world that's scared of dying. Listen, y'all, for the Christian to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hello. You start getting to be about the mission of Christ and you'll know. Listen, I'm tired. This is exhausting. This is worth this is there is a cost to following Christ. There is a cost to serving the Lord. You get tired. You get discouraged. You get weary. This world is not going to fulfill our life. And we know to live is Christ and to die is gain. And know this, friend, know this. There's appointed a time of once to die for you. Not twice, not three times, just once for you to die. It is a point in time. You and I have an expiration date. And guess what? You ain't skipping that date. Be smart with all this. Follow what you think we, you know, you're going to do. Be safe. Don't come to church if you're sick. We don't want it. But we've got to be about our Father's business. So this angel defies all who reject a supernatural creator. This angel defies all who reject a supernatural creation. I'm going to have to skip these two scriptures. But basically two scriptures here. Now let's hit them just real quick. Acts 14. The Bible says that it is vain uh, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In one sentence, in one sentence, Luke writes the same thing that this angel vows to God the creator of the universe that God created the heavens and he created the earth and he created the sea and everything that's in them either believe it or you don't and then Acts 17 24 it says the God who made the world and all the things in it since he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Later he says he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. You know what that tells me friend? Every single one of us have the same ancestor. One race of people. Man, if, if pastors would just preach the Bible, there are a lot of solutions to a lot of tough problems in the Bible. My Bible says that God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Not only did he make them, but he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Praise the Lord. You know what that tells me? Y'all, you are my people. You're my people. No, you're my people. Pete, you're my people. Jawan, you're my people. Jesse, you're my people. I don't have a people group. We are the people group. Adam is our father. Adam. You remember Adam and Eve? Adam is your daddy. And Adam is my daddy. We are one race of people. Again, believe it or not, you're talking to a lot of people in the world that don't read the Bible. They don't know the Bible. He says this. He makes this oath. There will be delay no longer. 
the martyr's question. I didn't realize how important this was in Revelation 6.10. Y'all remember this? And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And you know, the Lord said, Just a little while longer, just a little while longer. Here this angel, this strong angel, swears by the God of the universe, and he's given, he's commanded to do so, there will be delay no longer. The seventh trumpet is about to sound. The seventh trumpet encompasses the seven bold judgments. The final acts of judgment are about to ensue. The kingdom is about to take place. How many of you have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Anybody, raise your hand if you've ever prayed the Lord's Prayer. Let's look just part of it here. Matthew 6, 9 through 10 Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You've been praying your whole life for what this angel says, there will be delay no longer. You've been praying, and now there will be no delay in its coming, the kingdom of the Lord. Look at Revelation 11. We're going to be here in a few weeks. Revelation 11:15. 15, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The seventh trumpet that this angel is vowing that the end is coming and this seventh trumpet is sounded and the promise, all of heaven, it says voices are crying and loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Oh, what an awesome. Everybody say, wow. Wow. That's it. Then the mystery, the Bible says here, then the mystery of God is finished. The mystery of his kingdom. It was a mystery for his disciples. It was a mystery for Daniel. It was a mystery for Isaiah. It was a mystery for Moses. It wasn't a mystery for Jesus. It's, a mystery, it's been a mystery for us our whole life. We've been praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it ever. Amen. And, and we don't know, we don't know what that looks like. We don't know what that feels like. We don't know what it's like for the kingdom of men to become the kingdom of God and of his Christ. But the mystery is going to be revealed. There are many mysteries in Scripture, and these are truths God has hidden and will reveal in his time. There are mysteries hidden in the past that were revealed in the New Testament. <clears throat> Some of these, the mysteries uh, of Israel's blindness, the mystery of the rapture, the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the church, the mystery of Christ in the believer, the mystery of the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. All of these things the New Testament revealed to Old Testament believers that they didn't know. We are standing here at the cusp of potentially the mystery of the kingdom of God that is revealed to the earth. It's awesome. Now let's look not lastly today. The sweetness of victory and the bitterness of judgment. This is why I believe that this little book may be the scroll. Condensed down a little bit for consumption. Condensed in size. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, go take the little book, take the book which is open. Now that's a phrase, that's an important phrase. Take the book which is open. There's only one book that's been being opened, okay? May very well be speaking of this scroll, speaking of this book. Open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. Somebody said, well, if it is the scroll, then it is the Lord Jesus there holding the book. I don't know. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. 
And he said to me, <laughs> this is that very interesting phrase, command, take it and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little, book, the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So the same voice that John heard saying not to record the message from the seven peals of thunder gives him this command. Go and take the book that is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the land. Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will, in your mouth it will taste like honey. So he took the book, he ate it, it was sweet and it was bitter. What is this? Now guys, I'm going to speculate for a moment. Speculate what I think this means or potentially could mean. Why was it sweet to the taste? And why was it bitter in the stomach? I'll say I had a Kentucky Fried Chicken chicken sandwich a couple of months, uh, about a month ago that was really sweet to taste and it was very bitter in my stomach. I cannot even look at a chicken sandwich on top. I'm having trouble even talking about a chicken sandwich right now because of how bitter that chicken sandwich was to my stomach. you talking about double dose of food poisoning from KFC chicken. Woo, man, I can't even think about it. But why was it sweet and then bitter? Here's, here's what it may be. Victory is sweet. The answered prayer of the saints of God for really a couple thousand years praying for the praying the Lord's prayer praying for the kingdom of come victory of the world the murder of the saints the martyrs avenged the kingdom of God coming to earth Satan is defeated the battle is won God is glorified the gospel is spread to the ends of the earth Jesus sets up his glorious kingdom on earth Jesus rules the entire universe with absolute authority sovereignty and perfect righteousness truth and peace somebody say amen that is sweet that is sweet all these governments, man, all these folks trying to figure this out. There's only going to be one perfect ruler, one perfect judge, one perfect kingdom. One, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. Amen? Isaiah. Perfect truth, perfect righteousness, perfect justice, perfect peace. The lion and the lamb will lie down together, folks. If you want to see a perfect government, a perfect kingdom, there's only one of those going to exist. On the, there's only one that will ever exist on the earth. And it will be the transmission of the kingdom of men to the kingdom of God and of his Christ. One perfect kingdom. Christians, you cannot lose hope in this day. You cannot lose your mind in the midst of the trouble and turmoil and chaos and fighting and fussing and arguing and, and just lying. But let me just tell you, folks, these people are lying. They would, they would cut each other if they could. If they didn't think they were going to go to prison. They hate each other. We got two parties, Democrat, I, I keep doing the Democratic Party, Republican Party. They hate each other. They hate each other. And what and what what does Satan love more than people hating each other? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm gonna just tell you, folks, as long as this is happening, as long as this is happening in America, the people, for the people, by the people that these people are supposed to represent the people, it has nothing to do with the people. It has to do with me getting one up on somebody I hate and me making them look bad and me making them look bad, me tearing this party down and me tearing this party down. And let me just tell you, Christians, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Nothing good comes from this. And I know, guys, you're 
you may in your spirit, in your heart, you're fighting and clawing and scratching just to try to get maybe uh, something that you really want to get done, done in the earth. Folks, let me just tell y'all, I've been alive for 48 years, and for 48 years, we've been murdering babies in this country. We've been murdering unborn babies in this country. And from what I can tell, there's no end in sight. Let me just tell you, folks, as long as we continue to do that, and it's 48 years we've been doing this. And let me just say, look at me, look at me, look at me. Nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody. Your party, his party, their party, all they're doing is partying. Nobody's taking care of these little babies that are dying. Let me just tell you, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, there'll be no, there'll be no unborn babies dying. There'll be no laws that say to a mama that your body is yours and you're able to destroy this heartbeat inside of your belly. No doubt in my mind, the amount of little lives that have been destroyed by abortion. And just so you don't, just in case you don't know this, God. God is going to take care of this murderous nation. He's going to take care of it, y'all. And honestly, that is, doesn't taste sweet in my, in my mouth. And that's where the bitterness comes. Here's the truth. And here's what John knew. And here's what the digestion of the revelation of God and the seals and the trumpets and the bowls that are going to be poured out on this earth in the, it, to avenge the blood of the innocent is the realization of the terror and the devastation that the seventh trumpet will bring upon this world and the reality of what's going to happen sets in when we read the revelation of these judgments. And in one place in our mouth it tastes of victory in the kingdom of God is glorious and it is sweet but at the same time and I know y'all have experienced this because I have too when I read these judgments y'all there is a bitterness there, a taste about it in our hearts of the horror and the terror that people are going to go into it's devastating this I believe could be why when John eats this scroll that he experiences these two tastes that I believe our church going through this book of Revelation is tasting these two tastes, both the sweet and the bitter. He said, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And again, John is commissioned to write what he is seeing in the remainder of the Revelation. He is to write down the Revelation. He is to distribute it to the world. He was to warn the world of what is to come. And he has now been, and his writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has been warning for 2,000 years of the end is coming. So here we see the powerful, perfect revelation of the Holy Spirit of God to John about what is to come. Guys, there's only one takeaway. John was commissioned, he was commanded by God to write this vision and to preach it, to prophesy about it, to distribute this book to the ends of the earth, to everybody that he could possibly get this message out to. Guys, that's the only thing I know that we're supposed to be doing as Christians is getting this word out to as many people as we possibly can in the world today. There's only one takeaway for this. And it's very simple. It's not a new revelation. It's just the same thing believers have been doing for 2,000 years. Passing on to people around us the warning of judgment. The warning of the coming revelation and kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to be about. Somebody say amen. 
I didn't hear y'all. Right here. Thank you. Goodness. Quiet teenagers. I know they're not quiet at y'all's house. But anyway. So here's what I want to do, guys. And this is some, we need some starter fluid in the carburetor. Y'all know what you do? Y'all know when you need starter fluid in the, in the carburetor, you got to start cranking this thing up, right? Uh, we need some starter fluid in the carburetor. Now, this is, this is an event, but really it's not an event. This is just a start back. And I'm doing this with the spike in COVID and all this other stuff that's basically stalled uh, a lot of churches. And praise the Lord, y'all just keep coming. You just keep reaching. You keep loving people. You keep making disciples. So let's just keep on going. Amen? We've made through the first one. Let's go through the second one. But here it is. We're going to have a friend day on August the 29th. It's the last Sunday of this month. Y'all got a little piece of paper here, friend day. And so, guys, I only know one way to do church. One way is to do what people have been doing for 2,000 years, and that's to invite people to church. Amen? How many of you have heard at some time in your church life that we should be inviting people to church? Raise your hand. We should be inviting people to church. And uh, some of y'all are serious about it. You fill up a row every now and then with people that you're inviting to church. What you do with this card, you take it, you tear it in half, this is not a card that you need a million of that you're going to just distribute to as many people as you possibly can and invite them to church. Friend day is a day where we find a friend and we bring that friend to church or ask them to commit to coming to church with us on that Sunday. And the way that I do it is I, I would look at it and say, hey, Juwan, will you be my friend on August 29th? And come to church with me. But that doesn't count because Juwan's here every Sunday. So, um, but but I, I found a friend. I found my friend yesterday. I had been, uh, I've been developing this friendship with a young man in our neighborhood. He runs around the neighborhood and I stop and interrupt his run sometimes and we'll talk. Or I'll be out in the yard working and he'll come by and we'll talk. We've just been developing a friendship. And I'm... I knew, I thought I knew his name, but I wasn't sure about his name. Y'all know when you get to that point where you're really supposed to know this person's name, but you're like, if I ask them what their name is, this is going to feel really weird because I, I've forgotten their name and I'm supposed to know their name. So thank the Lord. I had been praying. We had a roster that they had sent out to all of our neighbors with everybody's name and their address and their phone number. But I lost that list somewhere along the way. I had lost that. And so, guys, listen, last week in the mail, a new directory, neighborhood directory came. And so I got in my truck yesterday. I rode around, and I saw the, the mailbox number, and, and um, then I pulled over in the driveway. He was out in the yard. I'm like, man, I got to know his name. So I looked it up. I found his name, and I was right. I really was right, but I didn't want to be wrong, so i just been calling him Buddy. Hey, Buddy, how you doing? That's what I call people if I don't know their name is Buddy. Hey, Buddy. And so, so uh, man, we stopped and we talked yesterday. This guy's gone through a bout, young man, been through a bout of cancer, fought through this cancer by the grace of God and by the miracle work of God. Um, he is really experiencing just great health. And praise the Lord for that. But he said, man, I'm going to come with you. Me and my wife, we are going to come to church on, he said, I will be your friend on friend day. So that's what I do. Man, will you be my friend on friend day? Stephanie has got two teachers that she is bringing to church uh, on that day and inviting them. And so what I'd ask you to do is take this card, pray about it, find a friend. Right now, we have eight friends on the board that are hopefully going to be coming so what I'd ask you to do is when you fill this out, put your friend's name, put your name, and just put this up on the board for, uh, for us just to begin to pray for our, your friends and my friends to come that day. I'm just going to share a simple gospel message uh, to preach Christ and Him crucified, to preach the cross of Calvary where the blood of Jesus saves our sins. Amen. Forgives us of our sins. I'm going to preach the cross. We're going to preach Christ crucified and raised from the dead and ask them to come and follow Jesus. As simple as that. But I'm going to encourage you, 
Find a friend. Our deacons next week are coming. Our deacons and their wives, we've asked them next week. You can come with your friends over the next few weeks, uh, your commitments. And last time we did this, there were 150 first-time guests at church that Sunday. And the only way that happened is that every person in our church at that time took this seriously and said, we are going to find a friend to bring to church. And so please do that on August the 29th. Why? Because the trumpets, the trumpets are going to sound. That, guys, that seventh trumpet, we're going to get there. The kingdom of God is coming. And we've got, we've got to tell them and warn them and compel them to follow Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Draw us close to you and commitment to you and love for you. Lord Jesus, I pray as a church, Lord, as we read these words, these words, God, that are very sweet to our taste. But also, Lord, as we read them and understand them, Lord, there is... There is a bitterness to them. There is, a, when we contemplate the horror and terror of what people are going to go through, God, it is, it is bitter as we contemplate these things. Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses of the gospel. God, thank you for all those who are here that are making disciples, who are being discipled, who are growing in their relationship with Christ. And I pray Lord, that in this invitation time, that each of us would take another step forward in our commitment and our desire to be faithful to what you command, just as the angel was faithful, just as John was faithful, Lord, to carry out your mission. Lord, help us have these feet of pillars of fire, God, to fulfill your commands, your assignments for our life, to take a step forward to use every breath in our bodies to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is near. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.